thank you for being here. Anybody here thinking they were going to see my dad and super disappointed, but uh, darn it, yes, there's, a, there's always one. <laughs> So just a quick story of how I got into the business and to the Norris Group. It was never supposed to be this way. When I was 19, I moved to New York City to, perform, uh, to pursue the dream of acting on Broadway. Um, so I lived there for seven years. I was a professional actor, touring the world as a singer, dancer, gymnast. In 04, I got the phone call uh, from my mom saying that she had bone cancer. And for some reason at that time, I was getting close to a few Broadway shows and I just, it didn't matter anymore. I came back here and little did I know my career was over anyway. As a gymnast and a dancer, I had back arthritis, I had to have ankle surgery, and how blessed I was to have landed on my feet in LA doing marketing in the construction industry. High end design on worldwide projects was sweet. Um, I was about to go back to a Wall Street gig in New York in, um, because I injured myself a lot in New York. I fell into acquisition and merger presentations at a Wall Street firm and knew I was super nerdy when I liked it. I liked all the data and I took that back to LA, almost went back to Wall Street, and Dad's like, why don't you help me write my first, well, not my first, it was actually his second market timing report in 2006, we released it called The California Crash. It was 400 pages, probably around 1,000 charts. Um, it took forever, and that's why I ended up landing at the Norris Group. So, uh, I, growing up, my dad was trying to show me Jim Rohn and all his favorite books on real estate investing, I was like, oh, Dad, I'm gonna be a performer. <laughs> all right. I don't need to do this real estate thing. And you know, he'd pay me like quarter, an hour growing up doing his fix and flips in his dirty houses. And I thought it was cool to bring home so stuff in the garage. But I never thought that I would be in real estate investing. So for those of you, I know there's a few people who are complete beginners in the audience and don't know what you're doing, where to start, it's possible. So uh, the Norris Group does hard money loans. We fund uh, investors who buy and hold, fix and flip, and new construction. Uh, we do some education. Uh, we do trustee investments, and uh, yes, the cocktail party statement is on hiatus, why my co-hosts decide to have kids, whatever, <laughs> hurry up, uh, but it's a business and marketing podcast. We read books and review them. I got my first uh, really ugly email actually last month. Um, somebody who completely disagreed with one of the reviews that we gave, and I've never received so much. It was literally hate mail. It was bizarre. People are very bold online. Go figure. Um, I volunteer a lot of my time for nonprofits, po mostly because I grew up in the nonprofit space. I was a recipient of a lot of nonprofit do dollars growing up in the arts industry. Um, but as a marketer, I love projects where I have no budget and am ex expected to do miracles with nothing. Uh, so um, I've helped raise over 1.5 million uh, for charity over the last uh, nine years, uh, and I'm going to keep it up. It's good stuff. So. Just so you know, I don't know if I'll ever consider myself an expert. I, these are just the list of the job titles that I have to focus on on the day to day. I'm constantly taking classes. Last year I was taking a 10 week intensive on YouTube. I thought I knew something about YouTube because I had been producing videos for uh, you know, five years. No, <laughs> it was very embarrassing. Uh, this year it's, it's uh, funnels, it's marketing funnels, getting better at really honing in on the web and getting people 24 hours a day, seven days a week, exactly where I want, where I want them to be. I won't cover that a lot tonight, but I don't know if I'll ever consider myself an expert because each one of these words is a topic all on their own and it moves very fast. I'm just dangerous enough to hopefully share enough with you to make a difference in your business. So my goals tonight is to completely overwhelm you. <laughs> We're gonna discuss brand. We're go gonna go into brand and understanding the customer. We're gonna talk a little bit about funnel marketing and lots of terminology to make you dangerous enough to where you don't get screwed. I hate small businesses being screwed because you get taken advantage of. I got, is this behind a, a firewall? So if I say somebody's name, I'm not gonna trouble. William Shatner's business called me today. Has anybody been called? Oh, I forget what it's called. I immediately uh, emailed Karen Hall because she had been called by the same. He tapes pre-loaded like questions, like William Shatner asks questions, and they pitch it like, it's a new show run by William Shatner. And it's like you in front of a green screen saying, yes, William, this and this, and he's just, <laughs> it's, it's awful. And they sell it for thousands of dollars, but I hate when small businesses get screwed. It's ridiculous. So hopefully I'll help you out. Uh, you have a little handout on your chair, and I'm gonna start, um, let's talk about brand for a second. What does the consumer think about you a lot of us like to think if we have a nice logo, uh, a business card that feels really good, that the consumers automate, they're like, this is my brand. This is what I'm putting forward. In the world of social media, all that's out the window. Somebody leaves you a bad review on Yelp and that's what's sticky. That's what shows up first. 
That's what they think. <laughs> what does the internet think about you? Because that's where a lot of people start their search. Funny story, last year was my 20 year high school reunion. My tenure, I was still back in New York as an actor, so people started looking me up. Well, <laughs> Aaron Norris is Chuck Norris's brother. So there's pornography sites dedicated to celebrities, and so my name started showing up. <laughs> so the rumor was like, oh, Aaron's been falling on rough times in New York. He's doing porno. <laughs> so <laughs> not my fault. Wrong, Aaron. <laughs> but it's true. What does the internet think about you? Actually, when I, the last presentation I did up <laughs> in Sacramento, somebody emailed me the next day, there's a sex offender with my name. <laughs> It's something you have to think about. What does the internet think about you? So your job tomorrow is go online and do a search for your name and your company name, not just on Google, but also on Facebook. We'll talk about why that's going to be important. Um, just start looking around, too, at your favorite websites, the brands that you respect. Type their name in. What shows up? What keywords are people looking for and finding their business? That's something that you have to think about. But internet brand is super important. All right. So. There's a lot of different ways to talk about brand, and if you're a, a marketer and you've taken courses, you might recognize this. It's called the four Ps. It's very corporate to me, and it's more about creating a product, but the four Ps simply stands for product. What is it? Was it taste, smell, feel like, the price? What's your price point? Promotion, where's the customer going to you know, hear about you? What are your marketing channels? And then place, where are they going to find you? So this is really good for things like launching a shampoo brand. It doesn't make me feel very good about the real estate business. Then there's a really great book. The Hedgehog, Hedgehog Concept comes from uh, uh, Good to Great. Fantastic, amazing book. And it really talks about you wanting to be right in the center. What are you passionate about? What drives your economic engine? And what can you be the best in the world at? I have shiny object syndrome. And so my dad talks about this all the time. He's like, right here. Stop talking about this. Be right here. <laughs> Earlier this year, I launched something called the Investor Roadmap because I feel like where investors get stuck a lot is there's too many ways to do the business. There's over 30 ways to buy and sell real estate, and it's really hard to hear people like, I'm marketing all over Riverside County. Really? How's that going? Palm Springs? Temecula Marietta? You're all of Riverside County. Really? That is very difficult to do. Or like, oh, I'm doing subject two. I'm marketing to landlords. I'm, you know, I'm working the MLS. I'm like, how's that going for you? That's that's rough. And then you find out they're an introvert, they have absolutely no money, and uh, <laughs> they're completely beginners and they don't have time to do the business. Got it. So the investor roadmap is simple, and on the page one, I'm going to ask you four questions. It's going to frame my entire presentation today, okay? So the very first question, please circle the options. Uh, fill in the following statement. In life, I A, get energy and find great joy working and interacting with people. B, find working with people neutrally enjoyable. I don't love it or hate it or them. <laughs> like to work alone and consider myself an introvert. I want to find out if you're an introvert or an extrovert, okay? Question number two, complete the following statement. When real estate investing, I want to be A, extremely involved in every part of the deal from finding the deal to designing and fixing it to selling it. B, want to be involved but plan to delegate. Or C, dealing with as few people as possible. I want to find out how much you want to be active in the business. Very important. Number three, please select your expertise level, uh, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. If you bought your home, I'm going to give you a little credit, maybe be beginner, advanced. Maybe you're in the mortgage industry. Maybe you're an appraiser. Do you have any real estate knowledge? Good to know. And then four, how will you finance your real estate? Have your own cash and great credit. I can get regular financing any day of the week. B, my credit is great, but I don't have cash available. I will need a partner. C, I have cash but plan to work with a hard money lender. And D, I have no cash and bad credit. When I do these over the phone, I do like half hour uh, conversations with individuals one on one. I find these totally rewarding. Um, but if you were to tell me that you're an introvert with no money that has no time to be in the business, I'm going to tell you to go home. Have fun in this group, but don't you dare spend $40,000 on one of these gurus uh, going around selling their product in a coaching program. You have no business doing this right now. This is a very difficult market. It's hard to be in the business and hard to find deals, and you'll get really frustrated. And the golden night is for you to be framing all this marketing stuff, trying to figure out what your brand is. So if you're an extrovert, this is the perfect market for you because you're going to be dealing a lot, of, a lot trying to find people with equity. It's about building relationships and rapport. My brother, I'll give a perfect example. Hopefully he never watches this video, Greg. 
He's a little bit more of an introvert. He's fantastic at systems, but he is rough around the edges. I can't imagine him across from somebody who's dealing with a death in the family. Um, he's got not as much patience as I do. I love people. I probably talk way too much. Um, I need somebody there in the house when I walk through a house because I'm so focused on the people. I'm like, hole in the wall, whatever. What's going on with you? So you really have to know who you are <laughs> in this business. But there's over 30 ways to do it, like I said. So I want you to start focusing on what you think you can be good at. The faster you get to that point, the better. So the way that I see a lot of deals coming in right now are relationships that were built after the downturn. So the MLS deals are sort of happening, but a lot of those relationships are cemented. The realtors know who they're going to go to when they have a short sale that they're tired of going through closings five times with. They fall out. They're like, they finally am going to allow me to go to a, a, real, a real estate investor, send it to the person that you know because you know they're going to close. It is really hard at this point to break into those relationships because they're very established. The vast majority of the deals coming in right now are coming from people marketing directly to people with equity. That means they're doing direct mail. They're doing a lot of cold calling. So it's the cheaper form of direct mail. They don't want to send a piece of mail, but they're finding out the phone numbers of the people who live there and making direct phone calls, or they're door knocking. We have a door knocking expert. Jack Fullerton is fantastic at that. But that's where the majority of the deals are coming from. If you would have talked to me five or six years ago, we would have had a conversation about trusty sales, REOs, short sales. And it, it's an introvert's dream come true because you get to beat up on banks. It's about data and numbers. Now it's different, OK? So on the sheet, if you ever want to do this with me, we can do it later because I don't have time to go through much more than this. But uh, on the, uh, the last page, there's this uh, roadmap link that you can go to, and we can do that another time, okay? But moving forward, I just want you to be framing about what you think you would like to do in the business. So when we tack, uh, chat, I have this matrix. So introvert, extrovert, you see active, passive. So I'm going to be suggesting people over here. So say you're completely loaded and you want to be completely passive, I'm going to steer you towards something like trustee investing because you don't want to deal with tenants and toilets. Maybe you're 70. Actually, I, I had this conversation about a month ago. He's like, I've got this lot in Newport Beach. I want to build a $2 million house. And he's in retirement. I'm like, do you really want that journey? That's a really risky thing right now. And he's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> so anyway, all right, let's move on to talking about what you bring to the party. Um, assets. Assets can come in lots of different flavors. It can come uh, with a personality. It can come, uh, an asset could be a specific place that you work. I worked for an architectural lighting designer in downtown LA that lived in one of the most historic, beautiful buildings. It was iconic. That was an asset of his to market. People loved just to come because it was the building. Um, it's a specific skill set, a negotiating skill. Maybe you're a really great salesperson. Who thought I could be an actor? Well, I guess actor, depending on the, the cycle, is really good. But uh, I never thought I could do real estate. Um, so what do you bring to the party? And you might be surprised what works. Um, currency, it's also what works in the market. So that's why the conversation, it changes. Five years ago would be a very different scenario than it is today. So what's important in the marketplace? Uh, I actually had a conversation a month ago with somebody who was so dead set on REOs because she'd gone to one of these free sessions from a national speaker. I'm like, OK, I need you to go to, in front to the computer. She's like, OK, I'm here. I'm all typing Bank, Bank of America REO. She's like, OK, I'm here. I'm going to type in Riverside. And it was their site of all the REOs. There was five. She's like, there's only five. I'm all, yes, thank you. <laughs> She's like, oh my god. <laughs> you know, She had made all these plans. I'm like, I don't mean to frustrate you and burst your bubble, but you're about to go down the wrong tube. Anyway, um, this is one of my all-time favorite books. It's actually one of my top three uh, marketing and strategy books, Blue Ocean Strategy. And it's best, I'm a very visual person. It's all about charts, OK? Um, let me see if I can explain this well. So Cirque du Soleil, who thought there was room in the circus business for a, a, a disruption, right? I grew up with Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, and then Cirque du Soleil. How many shows do they have in Las Vegas right now? Five or six? Five. Right, five at least. And they've been around a long time. And oh, I hate clowns. Saw a poltergeist way too early in life. <laughs> um, oh remains one of my favorite things, and I've seen over 30 Broadway shows. Um, it's fantastic. but. Let me explain this chart. So wide of the sky axis, low to high, these are the offering levels. And on the bottom are all the uh, competition points 
that circuses end up working in. So it might be hard to read, but you've got price, star performers, animals, aisle concessions, mul multiple show arenas. And Cirque du, Soleil's, Cirque du Soleil's formula was to eliminate that, which sounds weird because when we think about circus, that's what it was, right? So under the reduced item, they've got fun and humor, which I'm going to disagree with a little bit, and thrills and danger. Maybe they just lowered a little bit. They decided to raise the unique venue. And this is their blue ocean, completely uncharted territory, something that's so special to them, it's very difficult to compete. That's what we want to discover when we're trying to hunt out your assets that make sense in this market. So for them, they basically merged the circus with Broadway. Fantastic mix. Um, they spend a lot less money. It's a lot less PR nightmare. Um, living in New York with the circus coming to town, they always had to shut down the tunnels. All the animal activists were there. So this is how they made it work, and they've been wildly successful. There's a lot of great case studies in this book that are very inspiring, including wine, barefoot wine. I, am not, I do not have a sophisticated palate. <laughs> I grew up in a dry household and working in the restaurant. I will never forget the very first time somebody ordered a glass of wine. It's like, what do you want, red, pink, or white? Anyway, it's embarrassing. <laughs> At least I did not say Chardonnay, Merlot, and Jubilis, okay? Whatever. <laughs> I learned a lot in New York. But really great book. Take a read. I think you'll find it inspiring. But we want to find this, Cre uh, your blue ocean. Uh, let's go to, I put a little, if you want to go along the second page, you've got a little thing that you could start writing down. Along the bottom, maybe some competition points. You'll consider location, the kind of rehab that you're doing. Um, uh, we're always trying to find a way that we can pay more for deals to be more competitive. So maybe you're your own realtor and you're really good at it. Maybe you really love working with seniors. Uh, maybe, I don't know, anybody got any other good ideas, something special? Uh, two months of really great at numbers. Maybe you've got a, a financial planning background. Maybe you're good at estate planning uh, and can get very, very creative and really know what you're talking about. Um, I had a conversation a couple months ago with somebody from LA in the insurance business and he had already been doing flips and he was just frustrated. I'm like, you're an insurance agent. Have you ever thought about, you know, do you get leads that way? He's like, why? I'm all, some people just want to move on. They just had the most horrible thing happen to their house and 80% of it's going to be covered and you might be able to make them whole for 20%. And he was like, oh my God, <laughs> that's it. So you never know what you bring to the party, but that's unique to him. I might never ever have that conversation <laughs> ever again. Anybody in the insurance industry in here? No? Okay. The biggest mistakes I see, we aren't leveraging what we already have in place. Try to do too many strategies, cover too large an area. You stop learning and become irrelevant, or you never stop learning, learning and you never pull the trigger. I was the last bullet. I'm very late to the party. I was scared out of my mind. I thought I had to be a full-time flipper. Um, I'm kicking myself now because once I became a landlord, I'm like, this is easy. The last tenant that moved out, I got a hug from. She came on the day when we were doing the trade over. She just wanted to say goodbye and she gave me a hug and she teared up. And this other lady who was about to run, she was like, who is this guy? <laughs> I'm like, yes, can I get on a tape? Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I wish I would have pulled the trigger sooner. It's not as hard as you think. So anyway, let's talk about avatars. Not these blue people, customers. So we talked a lot about brand and now we're moving on to who our market is. So when we're talking about avatars in a marketing sense, we talk a lot about demographics, and that includes age, education, religion, ethnicity, psychographics, personality, values, opinions, all that kind of good stuff. And technographics was a word that was created in a book called Groundswell back in 05. It's remarkably still one of my favorite books on technology because it talks a lot more about the why to and not the how, which changes way too often. But technographics really talks about the ability of your customer or your avatar to be in specific locations when it comes to technology. Anybody seen a one and a half year old on an iPhone? They can't talk, but they can show you where to find pictures of them and a video. <laughs> Ever seen a 75 year old on an iPhone? 85 year old on an iPhone. My grandmother's 86 and she texts me, Aaron, why aren't you calling me? Love grandma. She's on Facebook doing the same thing. So. There's another really great book that I'm not going to get to talk about, but it's called uh, Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramids, talking about Fortune 100 companies working in third world markets making a killing, uh, talking, uh, working in areas where they make $2 a day and uh, how to make a lot of money. But the takeaway from that is watching these uh, third world countries go from 
no consistent electricity to like smartphone technology. They basically skipped 30 years of where we're at in the United States and how they're adjusting to that. But the user interface is so beautiful with technology now, they pick it up like that. So anyway, you can't, you, you can't make a lot of assumptions based on age, sex, race when it comes to technology because it's, they've done a very good job at making it very even playing field. This is one of my favorite approaches that comes from that Groundswell book on how to approach technology because I'm about to overwhelm you with a lot of data and information on social media. I honestly think a lot of it's not going to even be appropriate for you, but a lot of what I hear from nonprofits and small businesses are like, I want to be on Vine. I need to be on Snapchat. I need a YouTube channel. You know, it's just, it's too much. So the fourth step, this is called the post method. P stands for people. Who's your target audience? So who's your avatar? O is objectives, creating something measurable, a measurable goal. S is probably one of the, my favorite parts of this. It's strategy. Especially in the world of social media, how will your relationship change with your customer because you are selecting the next part, T, the technology? What's the most appropriate to meet your objectives and the people, uh, reach the people, and how is the relationship going to change? Um, I'm going to skip a lot of this because it's real estate specific, but more on the realtor side. But I'm always looking for data where to find people. So I'll go over a few. If you're a, a member of the California Association of Realtors, you can have access to this entire presentation. It's super nerdy, super long. Um, I just wanted to go on there for some information on websites for some realtors in the audience. So 85% of uh, buyers are using mobile technology for their searches. Why this is important for real estate investors is you need to make sure that your data is in updated on all these social media sites. Every different MLS is different and they have different data relationships and it changes. When I first started with my brother, gosh, what was this, 2010, I was going into Trulia, Zillow, Yahoo Real Estate one at a time. Every single house we had took me at least four hours to update everything because sometimes it would say it was a 2-2 and 1,200 square feet when it was a 4-2 and 1,500 square feet. It was maddening. It took so much time. And then I found a site for $29 a month. It fed my MLS feed, threw it out there and updated everything. But then the MLS, our local IM MLS updated it and started doing it anyway. Really frustrating and it's really hard to keep track of. But you just have to know that this is where consumers are doing their research. I'll get to iSurvive Real Estate later, but one of the reasons I wanted Zillow really badly on our panel was to have this conversation about digital disruption and how technology is changing the conversation. But 85% of consumers are starting online. And another really important thing you need to know, if you're thinking about dropping 10 grand on a new website as a real estate investor or a realtor, oh, look at that. Brokerage websites are the very least helpful according to the consumers. They suck. <laughs> so if you're thinking about spending that much money, shoot me an email. I'll talk you off the ledge and I'll talk about you if you really need it because you probably don't. That's not where the leads are coming from. At any one time, we probably have 30 or 40 uh, properties listed for sale at the Norris Group here and in California. A very, very small fraction. I can recall one time that a lead actually came from Zillow. So when you actually start looking at the data of where your leads are coming from, it's super important. I just basically turned a job that was four hours per property into nothing, gladly giving somebody $29 for the privilege of updating all those sites, knowing that at least it was going to be updated, but that I wasn't wasting my time because it was creating no money and no leads. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, just real quick on the Zillow thing, Realtor.com is doing a horrible job for its members. Um, when you do a search on a property, if you're in real estate, you know that Realtor.com probably shows up fifth or sixth, and I was trying to figure out why. And it's a little bit of a concern as well, something that we all have to think about. Sites like, this was the order in which it came up and I just did a search for a property. And it, uh, Redfin, Zillow, Home Seekers, Trulia, and Realtor, um, it came up in that order. And I was trying to figure out what are they all offering that Realtor.com isn't. One of the biggest things was, was pictures. Somehow, some of these other sites were keeping <laughs> photos of inside the property, which makes me a little bit nervous. So as we enter into the world of virtual reality, can't you imagine a thief like putting on his glasses and then going on Redfin, being able to walk through the house, they're like, oh, that's a master bedroom. I bet the, yeah, that makes sense. I bet the, <laughs> the master dresser is going to be right there, so I'm going to case that first. It's scary. You really have to think about those things, especially as a realtor. What if you're not being careful and people's stuff is all out? But 
one of the reasons that they're ranking better is there's more things to look at. Consumers can do more research. So there's pictures, there's how the schools are doing, and Realtor.com unfortunately are missing some of the major categories, I guess. So that's why they're doing better. Um, I'm going to skip some of this stuff. One of the reasons I'm also skipping this, I did a really good interview on the radio show with Michael Quarles. He is the owner of yellowletters.com. He spends about $100,000 every month on direct mail. And I was asking him, how specific do you get in your mailers? He spends, he creates very specific lists and then he sends about six pieces of mail to every home that he's targeting. And they all look very different. So one might be something that looks like a bill. The other might look something like a, a postcard. Another will look like a birthday card. So by the time somebody calls him, they might think that they're talking to six people, but they're all him. <laughs> and he's tracked it. He's got different numbers and codes. So when they call, he's tracking to know which one has worked. Um, very sophisticated. That's free on our website. Look it up. It's great. But I asked him, how specific do you get when you're talking to sellers? Like, do you say, oh, hey, I know somebody died in your family. Can I buy your house? He's like, no, absolutely not. It's all about the benefits. They don't need you to get that specific. You don't have to be creepy. It's really about fast closing cash quickly, right? So let me go through this and see if there's any other nuggets. But there's a lot of great information, too, when we go to sellers by generation. So um, baby boomers are net sellers of properties as they get older. So we've got the baby boom generation about to move on. If you're really great with seniors, OK. Where are you networking? Who are you talking to? Are you connecting with connectors that that is their clients? CPAs, financial planners, estate planners, attorneys. We all love attorneys. Attorneys in the room? Love you, it. OK. <laughs> um, top five reasons uh, people are selling. Um, if repeat sellers, I want to move to a better location. I want to downsize. I was retiring. And can you work some of these data points into your marketing pieces? I don't know. I'm always looking for different ways to get the message across. Um, I have heard reports because the most popular method of buying right now is direct mail. Um, they're sitting across from somebody who has like six yellow letters in their hands. <laughs> so it's, they're using the same company and it looks the exact same. How do you stand out? That's a big goal. By the way, if anybody has any questions along the way, let me know. I'm glad to stop and nerd out with you. All right. See? Lot I inherited my dad's nerdy chart stuff. I, I love it. All right. Zillow versus uh, Realtor.com. Realtor.com was purchased by News Corp, and they own some of the biggest brands, Dow Jones, The Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Market Watch, The New York Post. They've experienced some growth, so they're trying to do a little bit better. Zillow is still not profitable, but take up 70% market share when it comes to the mobile category for consumers. So as a marketer, I'm trying to think of how to get in the way of that. Um, I've, the only way I've really seen investors use this information is they're building squeeze pages with data that's probably coming from, I'm assuming, Zillow, APIs. Have you seen that? Where they build like Facebook. If you go on Facebook, it's like, hey, what's your house worth? And they go in and they type their, <laughs> they type their address. So you've already captured somebody who's interested in finding out what their house is worth. And then on the next page, like, hey, we'd like to send you your full report. You know, type in your first name and your phone number and, we'll, and your email and we'll send it to you. And they've captured all your information. It's getting so sophisticated. I did um, a webinar and I'll actually I'll send it to you. I have about two hours that I just did over the last month. And there's this um, software called HubSpot super tricky. It's like advanced marketing extreme to where it sort of ties in the email marketing piece and the web piece where the system knows exactly who you are when you land. And if you're on the other side of that, you can say, oh, so-and-so from this company just came onto our website. You should trigger an email to him or trigger one of the salespeople to call him. It is a trip. No, I'm not. Um, that's lead pages. Yeah. He's going to be a difficult one tonight. I'm just letting you know now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, it's, it's good. Um, it's a good service. We'll talk a, a tiny bit about that. That's advanced stuff right there. <laughs> uh, investors. I think we have to focus on being a problem solver. We have to be an expert at marketing, network, and exposure. We have to be creative. We have to be great at no negotiating. And I think we really have to be good at our local markets. What can be automated will be automated. If a realtor right now thinks that their reason for living is posting a listing on the MLS and that's all they have to do, 
I just I worry for their job security. <laughs> it's a little bit more complicated than that. I have a friend that just listed on Redfin, didn't even use a realtor, was happy as can be, got the price that he wanted, and this market works for that. You don't have to have a realtor in this market. So the value proposition is just changing a little bit, and I think investors are a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to that, because we have to think a little bit more carefully about that in this market. Let's go into a little bit about funnel marketing. This gets very confusing, but I want to talk about it a little bit. So high level, when I'm marketing, there's an awareness thing. So if you would have taken a marketing course about a decade ago, the rule was before a consumer made a buying decision, they needed to see your company or your brand seven times. You know how much it is now? 21. Takes a lot longer. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But my job is to make you aware and then take them down this path. And you can't really see it. It says plan, reach, act, yes, and convert. This is buying. And the bottom is engage. Some people make the really wrong assumption that after the buying is done, that it's over. But you really want raging fans. How do you make people happy at the very bottom to where they go through the funnel over and over again and they bring people along with them, right? So I think that's the major play for social media and why I bring this up here. Um, it's a relationship tool. And the reason why I think it's dangerous to only spend your time on social media, I'll talk a lot about too, because I think it's a slippery slope. Anybody watch the uh, new Ghostbuster film? Am I the only one? I'm going to embarrass myself. I was like, okay. There's a few people like, mm. has anybody been following the Twitter debacle that's been going on? Yes. Okay. So Leslie, what is Leslie's last name? Leslie Jones, 50-year-old black woman, SNL, very funny, very tall. I'm afraid she kicked my ass. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna play around. She is hilarious. Um, there's been a lot of really ugly people on Twitter. It's amazing what people feel the freedom to say. There was a gay conservative reporter from Breitbart who instigated some of it, and Twitter decided to completely shut him down. Yeah. Uh, so 20 minutes before he was going on at the RNC. They shut him down, so it seemed a little bit political, and Twitter has had a big backlash. Twitter is also not profitable. At one point, do shareholders go, you know what, it's enough. We don't want any part of this. It's scary. What if you as a business had spent all your time building your brand on Twitter for it to disappear? Anybody remember MySpace? Friendster? We've got case studies, and that can happen. So I want to frame that a little bit because it makes me nervous as a business why I don't completely dive in all the way on every channel. Every channel has a job for me and I have to make sure I constantly look at that. Let's talk a little bit about mobile. Mobile first was very important back in 2014. If you're not aware, mobile getting took place. If you don't have a mobile friendly or responsive design to where if you're on your mobile phone right now and you go to the Norse group, it's a totally different experience than if you were on a desktop computer. If you don't do that, Google ranks you lower. Just happened in 2014. Sorry about it. Wasn't me. <laughs> um, it's also mobile has just been huge. 68% of Americans have smartphones as of 2015. That's only going to go higher. The time spent per day actually went one hour. And I cannot wait for the Nielsen to release the next ad because of Pokemon Go. Who is playing Pokemon Go? I'm fascinated. Fascinated by Pokemon Go. It is fun and addictive, and there's so many business ramifications. It's ridiculous. I love it. Uh, Pokestops. Yes. If you're not familiar with Pokego, I'm going to let you. I'll inform you a little bit so you can nerd out with people who ask you. It's a virtual reality game to where monsters come at your phone, and it's I see a picture like a video, and there's monsters that you throw balls at. This uh, was Pokemon big in like the 90s. It was a cartoon. So now they turn it into a virtual reality game, and Nintendo has blown up. It has no nothing has ever caught on this quickly. It sur surpassed Tinder in a month. Everything, yeah, as far as downloads go, it's huge. So if you see kids walking around, not even kids, I'm sorry, me going around, and, and you see people doing this like zombies, that's Pokemon Go. Start watching; it's hilarious. Pokestops is where you can get things to power up and balls to throw. They fell off a cliff. People, People found, found dead bodies. bodies. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's interesting. interesting. Anyway, all that to say, sorry, shiny object, object syndrome. All this to say that a lot more people are going online. Who's canceled cable in here? Who watches more YouTube than they do TV? Who watches completely no live TV and it's all streamed or taped? Isn't that crazy? 
That's, that's a total change from, from what it used to be. be. So, so no, no wonder this has all gone up. But the category, um, what is it, smartphone, web app usage has gone way up. Um, all, all the rest have, have pretty much stayed the same, same maybe a little, little bit more on the internet, internet or PC, but small smartphone growth usage is, is just huge. Um, this is the problem. Remember how I said it's gone from seven impressions to 21, right? Second screening. Who's watching TV without their cell phone? I triple screen. <laughs> I will have Game of Thrones in the background, killing Pokemon on my phone, and then maybe I'll have my iPad out trying to catch up on the news or something. That's why 21 is the issue is because we're distracted. How do we use mobile while, while watching TV? The only reason I have this up here is, again, you can't make assumptions based on age. My grandmother is super into WWE. Don't ever tell her that it's fake. It's hilarious. <laughs> I'm just imagining her on her phone, like, looking up the wrestlers and stuff. Oh. Okay. The top web app for last year, the 2016, isn't out just yet. But let's go through these. Facebook, YouTube, Facebook Messenger, Google Search, Google Play, Google Maps, Gmail, Instagram. Who owns Instagram? Facebook. Who owns YouTube? Google. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. Good to know. iTunes and Maps. Uh, Apple Maps. How many brands are the top? Nintendo might break this. Might be the only one that breaks it this year. But how many brands are in here? Three? Three. What's your strategy as a small business to be here? And that's what we'll get into in just a second. As, As a marketer, marketer, I'm also constantly, constantly thinking of how these big brands are shaping our world and how it's changing so quickly. So once upon a time, Google was synonymous with search. Oh, Google it. Search it. But now they're developing thermostats and smoke alarms. But maybe it's not Google. Maybe it's Alphabet. Facebook was social, where I hung out with family and friends. But now they're creating, I just read an article about the free internet and the drones that they're creating to try to disrupt the internet market. Amazon was known for shopping, and now they're one of the largest entertainment companies in the world. Apple, they were synonymous with entertainment. Now they're working on a car and a badass home base up in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and Microsoft, known for business, they purchased LinkedIn, who had just pur purchased Lynda.com. I predict a huge upset in the education. I think education is a commodity. When I got my MBA at UC Irvine, it was 66,000. By the time I was done, it was 72. I graduated in 09, and I think it's close to $100,000 now for an MBA. On LinkedIn, if Microsoft could identify the best thought leaders that the community at large was friending because they saw them as the thought leaders, got to teach a class on their subject expertise, and they could take a full course wouldn't you, you rather take, take a financial planning course from Warren Buffett? Buffett? Right? right? Anyway, a little bit of prediction there. I, I think, think there's, there's a huge upset, upset coming. coming. Exactly. I think, I think school, I've already heard some people, I have a lot of people who work in the higher education field. Numbers, numbers are down. down. Numbers, numbers are down. down. So, so the, the question I ask, how do, how do, do these, these companies monetize now and in the future? future can, can they, they sustain, sustain themselves in the era of free software? This has been a prediction of mine for about five years. It finally happened this year, and I'm so excited. It's not quite free. Who has a $50 smartphone that's not all bad? Amazon. You know what the trade-off is? Highly offensive advertising. <laughs> that will be targeted, like you're walking down the cereal aisle, and it's like, Cheerios coupon, ah! It's going to be very highly offensive, geo-targeted, um, but it's brilliant. They've got uh, Amazon Prime. I order s way too much stuff. Thank God there's a trash can just for recyclables because it's all boxes from Amazon and Jet. Anybody use Jet? Jet is the competitor to Amazon.com and who does a much better job branding. Mm. You can send me all your savings. <laughs> Actually, there are cheaper. There's things that are on Jet.com that are a lot cheaper, and I think they're working with Costco because they have Kirkland brands. Pretty sweet. You're welcome. <laughs> if you learn nothing else today. So what industry are they trying to expand into as well? So we'll get into a little bit more. Let's keep going. We're going to talk about soap, not this soap or the delicious Mexican food. We're going to talk about shared, owned, paid, and earned. And on this sheet, there's this beautiful little bottom chart, this bad boy right here, and this is what we're going to go into. I'm going to spend a lot of time on the shared uh, stuff, the social media stuff, but 
I, as a marketer, have an own to earn strategy. I like to own all my own content, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to beat you over the head with a lot of data and statistics, specifically on Facebook, but we'll eventually get how I'm leveraging that to get earned media. Okay? So let's get into shared. Social media sites. A lot of them in C sort of slow growth, but there's a lot of people on them. A lot. I won't go over user trends, but 72% of adults' uh, users are on Facebook, and 60 Sorry, 70% engaged daily, 43% several times a day. They made over 17 billion the first quarter of this year because of advertising. It's a totally different ball game, and specifically this year, Facebook led the pack, but it's all pay for play. As a marketer, if you're an early adopter, you just got screwed. <laughs> Some of us who started early for small business buying fans, marketing to get likes for our business pages, you're getting the opportunity to pay for those all again. Because if you've noticed, if you run a business page, Facebook, your views are just going down and down and down. Facebook wants you to buy and, and boost everything. I'll, I'll share in a second how to get around that a little bit. But here's why it's such a big deal. Facebook, the time on site is huge. I'm very upset they stopped making this chart. But look, this says eight, by the way. Compared to all the other top internet brands, the time on site is just ginormous. Facebook is having a problem right now, and I, I'm not sure if it's going to go away. And I think this election is making it even worse. Anybody sort of backing off on Facebook because you're just exhausted by seeing the ridiculous things that people are posting? I'm burned out. Have you noticed that Facebook is asking you to be like, hey, remember this thing two years ago that was so awesome? <laughs> Five years ago? The problem is that they're having a hard time with consumers engaging. We're becoming more passive on Facebook because I think we're a little bit burned out. Um, I'm going to be interested to see how they fight against that in the next six months, and I don't know if they'll ever recover, because if we decide that, oh, maybe Facebook isn't such a big deal, maybe I don't need to tell you that I'm eating pizza or brushing my teeth anymore. Maybe we just shake it up a little bit, and so the experience changes. They want you to stay there as long as possible, because they make more money when they deliver more ads. If we decide to leave in mass, they have a problem. You're going to hear a lot of Facebook rumors. They've been unbundling services. Did you know one of the reasons they got Messenger onto its own platform is because you can now send money. You know the hashtag sign? Now you can send a money side. What if we could collect rent via Facebook? <laughs> your tenant's like, dollar sign, 1500 and it transfers right into your bank account. Not sure I want them friending me on Facebook, but <laughs> it's a possibility. Um, you're going to hear a lot about um, our younger generation not being on Facebook. It's a lie. They're there. They're just watching. They're not participating. They're just lurking because they know mom and dad and grandma are now watching. <laughs> they're using sites like this, Snapchat, WhatsApp. There's like a hierarchy of their close friendness. And like Facebook is the last thing. They'll show up like once a week to make sure mom hasn't completely embarrassed them online. <laughs> but that's about it. And Facebook fatigue. We're all experiencing that. And last year, I was sort of making fun of it because I knew it was false. But this year, I think it's really changing, and it's going to be interesting to see after the election what happens. So real estate in 2016, I've talked about it being pay for play. We have to get really sophisticated. Um, how does Facebook really fit into our business models? It's going to be a different story depending on our brand and what we're trying to do. Um, what if you're working with people directly and you buy a hoarder's house, and <laughs> you're posting things on, on, pay, on your Facebook page like, look at this idiot. Look at how much crap that they saved. How stupid. And what if they visit it? Who's your market? You have to be really careful what you share online. And you have to really identify who you're marketing to and make sure it's good for everyone that's going to be there. I think nonprofits have one of the hardest jobs because they have so many different audiences. They have the clients that they serve. They have their donors. They have their employees. They have government officials. And they have funders. How do you... How do you deal with all that? You know? So you just have to be really careful no matter what you're doing, how it really fits into your business model, understand who your market is, and can you measure it? If you're measuring likes as your strategy, like, oh, I want 500 likes, you're measuring the wrong thing. That was so seven years ago. <laughs> Not cool. You need to spend time with paid. I'm going to cover that tonight a little bit. Native video just means that you're uploading directly into Facebook. So I have been YouTubing for a long time. Whenever I create a, a video, I now upload it separately into Facebook because Facebook is giving me more credit as a small business instead of if I just linked to our YouTube channel. They don't like that. Um, and it plays into word of mouth marketing, which I'll get to. So small business owners who are currently running a Facebook page, let me show you a little trick to get around some of the nonsense going on Facebook trying to make you pay for everything. 
you're, you're going to have to have a personal Facebook page. I'm an early adopter, so I have two. So as a former actor, I have a very interesting crew with very embarrassing haircuts and costumes of me, so I've set the, separated that. <laughs> On the other side, I use it for the Norris group. I have two completely different audiences and two different accounts. How you accomplish that is you have to keep them completely separate, and you have to have different um, phone numbers and emails. There is a chance that if you are too similar, they will shut one of your accounts down. That's never fun. I've been on it for 10 years and they haven't shut me down yet, so. <laughs> for your business one, your personal page. So this is your personal person. When you like somebody as a friend, you create lists. So my friend Chathri that I did my MBA with, she now lives in uh, uh, LA, but we'll pretend she lives in San Diego and I created this list. I put her in a San Diego list. Then when I have something that's appropriate that she would like to attend, for my business. So the Norris Group speaks all over Southern California. I was in Sacramento last week. If you got a message from me that I was up in Sacramento, how relevant is that to you? You're in LA. Nobody cares. <laughs> so I'm irrelevant and Facebook knows that. It's monitoring you. And if not enough people say that they're going to attend your event or are interested, they're going to ding you and you're going to get less relevant and you're going to show up less. But I put everybody in lists. So when I'm speaking in specific areas, I'm able to inv invite just people in the LA market. And so it's highly relevant, highly timely, and it's a way for me to get people specific to that market to my business event page that makes more sense. So that's how you get around it. Once they're on that list and you do updates to the event, it pops up on their little icon, like it's a little update. So any questions on that? It's a little hard to see because I'm not showing you live, but you can email me later if you get lost. <laughs> All right. A little bit more chartage. I've been tracking this since uh, probably 2012. And I'll do the Inland Empire, but then I'll go into some uh, to Pasadena specifically. So these are the top 10 cities in the Inland Empire by population. And then the Facebook profiles are next to it in yellow. I further break it down by, by category, by age group, trying to see you know, different markets. But this is why I do it. If my goal is to reach people over uh, 65 in Riverside, there are more people in those 10 top cities then there is daily circulation than our most popular daily paper. Interesting, right? I, I just did this talk last week in Sacramento. Look at the difference. Very s similar, but not quite as bad. The Sacramento Bee, okay? Pasadena, totally different. You still have very strong circulation for the Pasadena Star, who knew? And very few just not that many people on Facebook, which is really interesting. But you have more people over 65 um, than you do people 13 through 30, and then also 47 through 64. I thought that was interesting. So you skew a little older. So as a marketer, if I was trying to buy inside Pasadena, I might use Facebook as a strategy, but I don't know. I would not, I'm not afraid of print. I like print. I like earning print better. I like appearing in the paper as an authority. I don't like paying for ads whenever possible because I haven't had good luck. I want to say it's their fault. It might be my fault. Maybe I'm just a horrible designer and I make sucky ads, but um, I'm not afraid of print. I'll try. The last time I tried with the Press Enterprise, I spent $2,500 for a weekend run quarter page front page on the business, uh, uh, the business part of the paper. Quarter page, color ad, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, guess how many calls? Zero. Zero. Yeah. Brutal. All right. So that's, that's why I collect some of that data. So I, more insight into the avatars and Facebook, the way that you find out this data is if you go to um, do an ad, you could start creating your audience. And you can select age groups. It can get super specific. We'll get to that in a little second. But so that's Facebook. Do you want to stop and ask any questions on Facebook really quick, whether you should do it? <coughs> questions on features? No? Did I beat it up enough for you? OK. <coughs> LinkedIn I'll cover just really quick. There's a lot of people there, but the biggest concern is that people aren't there very often. How many of you are on LinkedIn every day? OK. I think that's enough to show you why LinkedIn is a, big, a bit of a concern. There's a beautiful part that you can use though, as a real estate investor. Um, reconnaissance, <laughs> trying to find people's contact information. Um, if you run a customer relations management system, I capture a ton of pictures. If somebody changes their email or mailing address, I go, LinkedIn is one of the first places I go to, um, to check out where they move to. Um, sometimes when I send a mailer and it gets bounced back, that's what I'm doing right now. I'd sent out a mailer, 
I'm trying to reach everybody out. I go to my CRM system. I click over to LinkedIn. I'm calling them. I'm emailing them, and I'm a lot on LinkedIn. They are not going to miss me because within <laughs> five minutes, I've reached them via three different channels. Annoying? Yes. Effective? Definitely. So there's over 300 million users, highly educated, high net worth. I use it to look at hires, um, do reconnaissance. I'm trying to think of other ways. And you can use it as a low-level CRM system. You can take notes on contacts inside. So if you're going to go back and use it as a business marketing tool, it's great. But I don't know. I don't see many marketers using this really effectively. Maybe it's just because I don't use it effectively. But I do. You do? Do you use it quite a bit? Wow. Export their email list to any other marketing piece I want, and MailChimp will verify, or any company will verify them as a valid contact because they're my connection on LinkedIn. But if you haven't had people complain about that? No, that matter of fact, it's probably one of the reasons the investment fund grew so fast is because I dumped 2,500 contacts into a mail list. And <sighs> He's. Steven is a smart guy too. That's, that's tricky. And you have to, I'll talk about some email horror stories because emails are tricky. If you do it wrong, you can not only shut down <laughs> you as an email address, but your entire office. <laughs> I'll share an embarrassing story. Story time that's embarrassing, so you hopefully don't do the same thing. But that's good. That's important. I did um, an interview with somebody who's really into SMS marketing, so that's mobile marketing, and the right to have somebody's cell phone number, it's just super tricky, and you have to be careful, and it has to be part of your marketing mix. It can't be <laughs> texting people every day like, hey, how you doing? Let me buy your house. So, um, okay, real estate and social media, I'm really only going to cover those two. Twitter, to me, for me personally, has been more of a news aggregator. We run a blog, and I do videos based on news. Twitter has a job for me. I don't know anybody who's bought a deal because of Twitter. I think it's a big time suck for real estate investors. Just that's me. Anybody have any great experience with Twitter spending, wasting time? Snapchat, Vine. <laughs> OK. I want to stop at those two. But real estate and social media is important for me because it leverages word of mouth. Um, and I'll get into why that's important in a second. You can build relationships. I use it for customer service all the time. I've got some people who only want to message me within Facebook, <laughs> which can sometimes be annoying because I have to make sure to check it. Uh, they don't want to email or call. They want to Facebook message me. OK. Um, you can target market beautifully. It's measurable. I love things that are measurable, um, and it really helps me do that. Allows people to find and interact with your um, search engine optimization I'm going to go into. And let's talk a little bit about the semantic web. Some of you might have seen this example, but it helps me explain where we're headed. So Web 1.0, if we're talking about movies, is a site that looks like this. 1990s, movie time. There's a website, awesome. That's all you can do. It's just a listing. Web 2.0 is a site like Rotten Tomatoes, where you can watch commercials, buy your tickets, leave your reviews, tell it you want to watch it on Netflix later when it's almost free, all that kind of good stuff. Web 3.0 is me saying, Siri, it's Thursday. I've been so busy preparing for Pasadena Phoebe. Christina really dug in, wanted me to do a good job. I don't have any plans on Friday. It's embarrassing. She comes back to me with a British accent, because that's what it, it's awesome. <laughs> She's like, Aaron, you work so hard, and you're so handsome. I trained her to say that, too. She's like, I'm gonna f I know you like a little adventure, so I'm going to find a Mexican restaurant with a four star or more on Yelp, and I'm going to go ahead and book it on Open Table. I'm going to reach out to your Facebook friends and see who's in town, whose schedule is free, and then plan on drinking. I'm going to order you an Uber. We'll pick you up at 5.30. And the movie will take plan. The restaurant will be uh, taken care of. Don't. It's done. What's really crazy about this is about six years ago when I started doing this specific piece, you guys all looked at me like I was Satan. <laughs> Now you guys are shaking your head like, oh, we're not that far away. Matter of fact, just this year, Apple just released some code so um, developers can start working more with Siri. Here's the interesting thing. It's not just Siri anymore. We've got Cart Cortana. We've got uh, Facebook developing M. Who else do we have? We have um, Alexa. Every major internet brand has their own personal assistant that is going to be coming into our lives. So real estate, how, how would that work? Oh, I just had a huge payoff. I have $100,000 in my pocket. Zillow, when I drive by a house that's owner-occupied, free and clear, you know, 
zing my phone so I can go door knock. I don't know. It's not that far off. Watch internet companies like PropertyRadar.com become more marketing focused and not just about data. That's going to be turning data into information that's uh, going to be pretty exciting and interesting. So the technology behind this are aliens. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's called artificial intelligence. Uh, it's all about being hyper-connected. Your house, your car, your phone. It's a little creepy. They, the phones know that we're all here right now and the Pokemon are waiting for you to kill them. Uh, technology, facial recognition, your personal assistant, the location triggers, activity monitoring, preference recognition. We will all in this room have very different experiences based on what we search, what we do, what we buy. Have you ever heard of that case study of um, a father getting upset, like calling Amazon or somebody because they sent their daughter like a uh, diaper, diaper uh, coupons and they're like, how could you do this? I have a 17 year old and she's like, dad, I'm pregnant. They know, they know. <laughs> Awkward, yeah. Oops, they ruined it. So anyway, artificial intelligence, that's where we're going. And I'm, I'm glad that nobody looks at me like I'm Satan anymore, that's helpful, but it is scary. There's a little bit of a creepy factor to it. It's changing a lot. Um, all right, so we covered shared. Anybody have any specific questions about social media, the shared piece of this little project? Google. Oh, Google Plus. Are you that person that's still on it? <laughs> Google Plus is interesting. Google AdWords. It's a little bit advanced and it's hard. I will talk about paid ads when we get to paid up here. Um, I think you, small businesses need to have a little bit more bandwidth there because it's tricky. Are you going to talk about what to share? What to share? Oh, that's a good... Thank you. What to share for real estate investors. The best thing that I've seen performing online is before and after photos. It depends on how you're trying to use Facebook, though. So I would do that if I was trying to get funders. Um, if a consumer is looking, I don't know. I just don't have any good data to show that people looking to sell are going on Facebook right now and saying, sell my house fast. And then how do I get in the way of that? I fully believe that Facebook is going to dive hard into search starting this year. If you haven't done a search of your name or a term up in Facebook, it's coming. So. I'll talk a little bit about search engine optimization later, but the next phase is voice search optimization. What comes up when I say, hey Siri, where's the next you know, closest hard money lender? I want to be first over this guy. You know, how, does, how does Siri or M or Cortana make that decision? Huh? You're still first. You're still first. The well, <laughs> what? The <laughs> oh, yeah. What? The, hey, it's harder to rank. I had something really scary happen earlier this year. Um, our, oh, we talked about this. And the name service changed for our website. Our website that was down for two full days. It's taken me eight months to recover on my keywords. It's brutal. Jack. Aaron, Aaron, you know that I have uh, that mastermind group meets every Wednesday night. Mm hmm. And, and we got lots of clean clear properties. Yeah, what? We have lots of clean clear properties. Oh, okay. I mean, probably five, six times a door in the group. Okay. It depends on the business. So what would you want to do with your mastermind group? Why would you want to be on Facebook? To get more people in your group? No. To sell properties? No. Do you even care? Do you want to be on Facebook? No. Then don't. <laughs> well, so my point is that those are the people that you want to find when the old language is ready to call it quits. Sure. And they don't know how to get involved. Well, that's true, but they're showing up. Are, are you on Facebook? You're not on Facebook at all. So it's something as marketers that we have to think about. I'm not always going to reach everybody that's got free and clear properties. Not every single one of you is on Facebook, unfortunately. <laughs> if it's, mar it's marketing. It's you've got to reach them another way. Postcards, door knocking. Some of the, some of the old and tried and true still work. No. You're selling, I'm buying, so I'll <laughs> yeah. Call me when you're ready. Yeah. All you have to do is come to this club. There, 
one of the reasons I wanted to show you this are, are these are just some of the four major categories of great groups of ways to market. Some people might decide just to focus on one because maybe they don't have the bandwidth and they're not good at earned. Like the, earned, the press isn't calling them to you know, feature them in articles and people aren't going to call because you were in the LA Times. So social media doesn't work for everybody. So remember the post method, the people, objective, strategy, technology. If we don't meet those th first three filters, if my audience is not there, I'm going to leave it out. I don't want to ever see you on Vine or Snapchat. But maybe Facebook at some point, maybe not. If nothing else, getting your brand names locked up on Facebook so cyber squatters don't happen. I had somebody buy tngtrustdeed.com, not plural, because we spoke in San Diego and they found out before I did or I didn't think about it. And I called him after the SDCAA meeting. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, oh, I was in the audience and someday I think I want to do trustees and you're sending me free traffic. Thanks. People are jerks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just tying up brand names online, making sure that you're protected. It's stupid that you have to think like that, but you do. But it's not always appropriate. I agree. Not everybody's going to be there, and we have to assume we have to have a marketing mix. This is just one tool. So hopefully, I'm sharing with you, maybe you don't want to be here. <laughs> I'm showing you all these charts, so it's not appropriate, and that's OK. All right, let's get into owned. And this is my strategy. It's called owned to earned. And we'll get to the other pies. But owned is stuff that I create, that I own. And I'll push it out to all the shared channels. But I blog every day. We run a weekly radio show. And from the radio show, I turn into a podcast. From the podcast, I turn into transcription because I have people that read my radio show. <laughs> I also tape a video every Friday that also features things from my blog. I mention all my keywords. I, I talk about our hard money loans, and I talk about the radio show. So I cross-promote all my other content. That video gets uploaded into Facebook, goes out to YouTube. I'm also tweeting it out. So I have all this content. My radio show alone, I'm dragging through all the different channels. It's in Google Play. It's in Apple iTunes. It's on Twitter. It's on Facebook. OK? One piece of content, I am milking it <laughs> for all it's worth. So Twitter, I'm there, but I don't spend a ton of time. But as a, as a larger brand, it's much more difficult for me to compete on a regional level. In some ways, Google is favoring local companies. So if you're a hard money lender in Pasadena, you are going to do better than I am as a Norris group, most likely. I am having to work my butt off now to even rank at all. It's just that's the name of the game now. Facebook is trying to give a thumbs up to the local guy. That's good. I just have to work harder and think smarter. I also do print. I do birthday cards. Once a year, I do at least one mass mailer to make sure my list is clean. Um, the ones that get bounced back, I have personal calls. I have 10 minutes. Holy cow. OK. Email is a huge asset for me. Uh, super important to keep it clean, do it right. Embarrassing story, I bought a list of 20,000 realtors, uh, decided I was really smart, and bought a program even to throttle it, throttle it out 60 uh, an hour. So one a minute, no big deal, wasn't super salesy. I got shut down because too many people complained, and AOL, Comcast, and Earthlink treated me like I was an absolute criminal. I had to hire somebody full time to not only get me off the blacklist, but our entire company. Anybody within our company tried to email anybody with those extensions, completely blocked. Email is very tricky. You have to do it right. But that's why MailChimp, Constant Contact, if you want to learn any of that stuff, they have so much great free training. Um, and I think it's free for a certain amount. Make sure it's up to date. Make sure you have people double opt in. It's very dangerous to buy lists and email it. I don't know if this is true. I have been shut down by, Google, uh, by MailChimp before. I got shut down, and I have since last year completely started over. Everything double opt in. OK. And, and they don't let you pull your data out, right? So hopefully you have a backup, but I don't think they allow you to pull the data out. I got, so they shut me down, and they validated. OK. But Yeah. Double opt-in double opt just makes, means that you've given me permission to email you. You signed up for something. So remember when we were talking about the funnel? When it comes to the awareness cycle, what are you doing to get a customer in there to begin with? Is it downloading a white paper, downloading like how to sell your, sell your house fast? You know, how are we getting them where we want them to be as quickly as possible? Okay. Email tips, don't purchase lists. Know your limits. I thought I had the right to email you every Tuesday because I have a radio show. I called it Tuesdays with TNG. I thought it was super catchy. You didn't. Readership went down 10% every week. After four weeks, I gave up because I would rather you go, oh, it's something from the Norris Group. Awesome. Instead of like, uh, again, anybody use Outlook as your email client? 
Notice the clutter folder. So just like Facebook is making uh, friend decisions for you, you know on Facebook that third grade boyfriend, girlfriend that you friended like two years ago and it was that super awkward moment like, hey, it's been so long. And now they're not appearing on your Facebook feed. Microsoft is doing the same thing. If you're deleting emails before you're opening them and reading them, it's knowing that that's sort of not quite spam. You signed up for it, but you're not reading it, so we're going to move it over here. You're spam. So companies that are emailing too often and don't know your limits, you might have already ruined it. <laughs> you have to really stay up on this stuff. Mobile first, you have to make sure your emails are mobile friendly, and when you're clicking over, they need to be going to something that's mobile friendly, because a lot of the emails are happening on mobile. Um, hmm? Formatting? Link formatting? No. So I got told by MailChimp because everything was spam that Aiden had a, uh, a random extension. So instead of being like, in, in MailChimp you have your uh, click here yeah. to view my thing. If you don't do that and you leave it as the random extended link Kay. with all the variables that's uh, tra a tracking link, oh. it's spam. Yeah, if you do a lot of like marketing tracking software, they don't like that. They like to see brand names like the NorrisGroup.com and not some kind of email marketing link. Yeah, I, I don't do that because. Oh, wow. Because, like, and immediately, like, the, you saw the list go from, you should have a 20% engagement on one list and have 40% always on another. Oh. I went from 20 to 8 just by changing that. Wow. Yeah. Oops. So one of the reasons you want to use a system like MailChimp or Constant Contacts is that you have data. You're able to see open rates. You can even see which customers are clicking through to links. So if you're going to spend your time calling people, why not talk to that person who clicked that link like 15 times? Maybe they just don't know what they're doing, or maybe they're really excited about something. That's a really cool clue. I still love direct mail. I actually just gave this up. This is called the Max Writer. This is what President Obama uses, maybe not this machine, but I'm sorry he is not sending you birthday cards with a personal <laughs> signature. This is a machine where you can put a crayon, a pen, a pencil, and it looks dead like writing. And I can create some scary stuff like, hey Tom, saw your house on so-and-so in this city, great flip, would love to work with you, Aaron. And it looks like it, it was handwritten, just not by me. So there's a lot of cool things out there. You can email me if you want some tips. Web and blogs for real estate. A lot of websites now are built on blogging platforms. You can buy beautiful website templates. Please do not spend $5,000 on websites. You can buy a template, mobile friendly, for $50, have it installed out the door for $500 and be a happy, happy camper. Just careful. OK, this stuff is important. Search engine optimization. This is an old screenshot of a Google search. SCM stands for Search Engine Marketing. It's the paid ads, also known as paid per click. Depending on your industry, you could spend anywhere from $2 per click to $80 per click, and I'm not kidding. <laughs> the attorneys get to pay a lot more. Thank God. Anyway, SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. It's also typically called free. You're showing up free. You're ranking. Yay, this is not free. Many of us spend a lot of time, energy, and money producing content to rank here. SEO trends, it's all about quality content. Um, once upon a time, if you were selling cat food and you had cat food five million times on your page, Google's like, oh, that site wins. They're talking a lot about cat food. Now it's not about that at all. It's about user experience. It's about speed of the site. It's about quality content. It's about social clues. You know, what's being shared online? What do people like? Links are still important. If the LA Times links to the Norris Group, it's a lot more powerful than your blog site linking to mine, okay? Mobile friendly is uh, really important, and more and more load times are going to be super important. So I d does anybody use Bing as your home page search? I won't judge you. It's OK. This was taken a few years back when I was in San Jose doing a marketing talk, and I searched for pizza. Up top, you've got the paid ads. Below that, the natural ranking. It knew I was in San Jose, so it was trying to deliver geo-modified ads um, on pizza places in San Jose. And this is when they had a relationship with Bing and Facebook. These are all my friends talking about pizza. If I was a consumer looking for a realtor and typed in Bing, or Facebook for that matter, realtor, which one of these four categories would I likely use? Word of mouth marketing. It's that personal touch. Of course you're going to talk to somebody that you have a connection with. And that's what's so crazy cool about Facebook when they decide to turn this on. They haven't quite yet, and I don't know why, um, but I expect it soon. So that's why we covered so much in, on Facebook and social media. It gives clues. Maybe you're not super active, but you're trying to give the internet clues that you're, you exist, you're legit. 
I got told one time, one of my last jobs before the Norris Group, somebody almost didn't come work for us because our website was so horrible. It's something that, especially the younger generation, they just think you don't care, like you gave up. Like, really? This is not a mobile-friendly website? Mm, you're not ready. The more sophisticated you get, we can talk about more sophisticated things. I want you to remember Cookie Monster because there's things called cookies. When you click on one of my ads, I send you to a site that installs cookies on your computer and I follow you around. No, I do not advertise on the BBC, the British network. <laughs> but I've had people say like, oh my goodness, I saw you on the BBC, that's so cool, you advertise there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's code that tracks you and it goes to all the different websites that you go. So if you visited Amazon and you're looking for a product and you go over to Facebook, you're like, why does Facebook know that I want chocolate chips? You know, I don't know. That's what that is. So you can drive consumers to your website and that's why I want owned. I want people to always end up on my content so I have a chance to reach that 21 impressions. Super important. Own trends to know. Mobile first we talked about. Speed is going to be increasingly important. Content marketing is very tricky. I think you have to have the right people. Some people want to do podcasts. Maybe you're uncomfortable with that. Maybe you want to do video. Um, it's not for everybody, but as a, you should be looking at CRO, conversion rate optimization. The more sophisticated you can get, you can look at the total marketing dollar that you achieved and how many conversions you had. How many people did exactly what you wanted them to do? Hopefully it's making money of some sort. That's the ultimate goal and start looking at where all your leads are coming from. You might be surprised. We talked about VSO and I sort of have to go a little more quickly. Um, tips for our uh, real estate investors, less is more. Focus on your brand and strategy, authenticity. Be you, don't do anything else, it's super awkward. I hate watching videos where somebody shouldn't be on video because you hate it. I can tell, you're awkward, it's awful, don't do it. <laughs> If you're looking to learn a lot more, there's a lot of different groups that you can go to, especially in the LA area. You got the Advertising Federation, and they typically have a student chapter to where if you're looking for interns, you might find somebody who can help you out. Um, they're focused more on design, web design, video. That's where you're gonna find at the AAF. The AMA, American Marketers Association, I think they have a very large uh, LA chapter as well. Um, and the PRSA, I am the Western District Chair next year, so representing professionals from Hawaii to Colorado, I get to sit in that position next year, 2,200 members. I love PR because it's not my background, but I love the way that they think. They really believe in research, planning, execution, and measurement. How are you measuring success, making sure you do that? Repeat, do it all over again. Paid, I'm gonna talk about paid really quick, and I'm sorry. Facebook, lots of really great categories have showed up in the last year. You can market based on zip code, income, net worth, Home ownership, generation, if there's renters, when the home was built, if they're likely to move, veterans in the homes, millennials that you want to kick off the couch, you're newly engaged and newly wed. It's pretty cool. I haven't heard a lot of success stories in the investor realm, I gotta be honest. The conversion is just hard. Um, conversions. Let's talk, let me end on this, because this is where small businesses get absolutely screwed. And I'll, I'll share a story. <laughs> I Survive Real Estate is coming up, and I work with HGTV. Uh, I think this was back in 2010. I'm like, I have this great event. It's sweet. This is what we do. We raise money for charity. They're like, good for you. I've got a site that's got 3 million unique hits every year, I mean every month. We'll give this to you for $3,000 when it typically costs $10,000. I'm all, great, awesome. If I get just a fraction of 3 million impressions, that'll be sweet. If I just get 0.1% click-through rate on those impressions, I'll be home free. In three months, I had three clicks, and I'm pretty sure they were all me just making sure it was still working. <laughs> I paid what, myself $1,000 per click for the right to be on a website. So if you have any marketer calling you talking about impressions, don't fall for it. <laughs> Call the people that are advertising on the site, see if they're happy, make sure it fits your pipeline, whatever you're, however you're driving people to your site and ultimately doing some kind of business with you, make sure you're doing it right. I'm so sorry, I wasn't watching in time and I didn't know how far to go. It's all right, I'm gonna send Christina three other webinars, they're totally free and they're a little bit more advanced. They talk about SMS marketing, HubSpot, and live streaming. Live streaming is huge right now on Facebook and they're giving you a huge bump of small business if you do it. It's not for everybody, but we talk about how to set up and how to do it right. With that, I'll hand it back over to Christina and thank you for your time. Don't leave, okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, anybody enjoy tonight? Yes. Yes.